Good evening. Tonight we're going to learn about combustion. We're going to do a couple of simple experiments with a candle to tell you all about some simple properties of combustions. Let's begin. The candle and its flame may look simple, but in fact it's a complex mixture of chemical and physical processes that are needed to create the combustion creating the candle flame. Air is one of the necessary ingredients to create combustion. Take air away and the combustion process stops, and the candle flame is extinguished. We will now do a small experiment in which we will let the flame use up all the air in the cup. When the air is gone, then the flame is extinguished. We will now limit the amount of air that the flame can use by placing a cup over it. We see that as the air is used up, the candle does not burn quite as brightly. It goes dim until it finally goes out. Let's do the experiment again, but with a bigger cup, and this also means a bigger amount of air. As before, we place the cup over the flame. And now we see, with the larger cup, that in fact there's more air and it takes longer to extinguish. In fact, since the cup is about twice as large, we see that it takes almost twice as long for the flame to extinguish. The candle itself is a solid piece of wax, but with the heat produced by the flame, the wax melts to liquid dripping down from the candle. The flame itself is a gas. The liquid is evaporated, and then the gas ignites to make the flame. We will now show with a simple experiment how this happens. The heat of the flame melts the wax to a liquid, which in turn evaporates and then ignites. We don't see the evaporated wax because it is burning. But what happens when we blow the flame out? With the flame gone, the wax is still hot enough to evaporate. We see the evaporated wax as white smoke rising from the candle. With a match, we can light the white smoke and not even be close to the wick. Let's look at it again. Here we're in the white smoke, and now we're slowly igniting the wick. Here it has ignited, and we're not even close to the wick. Now let's look more closely at the flame itself. You can see that the flame is not just one color, but in fact has many parts to it. The easiest to see is the blue part at the bottom. Now above the blue, there is an orange that turns to bright orange and almost white at the flame. And then, at the very tip, the color lightens to another orange again. The blue color reminds us of, for example, a gas stove burning a natural gas fuel, which is a hydrocarbon. Hydrocarbon is a species made up of carbon and hydrogen atoms. Wax is also a hydrocarbon, though a much more complicated one. Since the two flames have the same color, we can guess the two fuels are made up of similar things, and we can guess the blue color comes from the same molecules. Most flames we look at are not the pure blue flames of a stove, but have an orange color. Here, a Bunsen burner at the right is adjusted perfectly for combustion. To the left, there is less oxygen, and this creates an imperfect combustion, and the orange color appears, for example, like in a fire. We also know that many different things have many different colors. Each color of the spectrum has a certain wavelength, as specified the spectrometer. The blue color of the flame means that it's emitting blue light in the blue part of the spectrum. Looking at the spectrum, this means that it's emitting from 400 to 500 nanometers. This is measured by the spectrometer. From previous experiments, scientists know that this can correspond to the carbon molecules of CH and C2. 
Normal flames are not so efficient. In a normal flame, the black particles of soot are formed. For example, if we hold the surface above the flame, we can see the soot that is produced. Although this makes the flame dirty, it does have a very distinct advantage, which we can use. Here we see the soot being formed on that white surface. So at the top of the flame, we have what's left over, which is the black soot. In fact, the bright light of the flame is the glowing soot particles. Without them, for example, in an efficient stove, this light would not be reflected. In other words, we can't read by just the stove. We need the candle with its reflected soot particles to be able to emit the white light. Flames are not just used as light sources, which we found out was due to the soot in the candle, but are also used for heat, such as in a fireplace. We also learned that the flame has different parts because of its different colors. So one question is, can we ask where are, what are the temperatures of the different colors? Let's try to measure, with a very fancy device, the temperature in the different parts of the flame. Temperature can be measured electronically with a device which measures the electronic currents from a thermocouple, which looks like a wire. The thermocouple is connected through the electronic device, which translates the information to temperature. We put the thermocouple in the flame, and slowly the wire heats up to the temperature of the flame itself. We know it's the temperature of the flame when the temperature slowly becomes stable, or the same temperature. And now we see that it basically stabilizes 667 degrees Celsius. Now let's move the thermocouple a bit higher in the flame, and here we notice that it gets a little bit hotter. In fact, it gets about 70 degrees hotter to 750 degrees Celsius. And here it stabilizes about six, 764 or something like that. And let's move it up even further up. And as we move further up, it gets even hotter. So what we can see is, as we move up the flame, the temperature is getting hotter and hotter. And in fact, this one is about 100 degrees or even more, 130 degrees Celsius, hotter than it was at the bottom. In actuality, the temperature is much higher. Actually, it's about 1,000 degrees uh, Celsius. But our device is not so accurate because it's a little bit too big for the flame. So if you have other problems like sooting. So I hope the next time you gaze at a candle, you will see not only its beauty, but also the beauty and complexity of the combustion process that created it. Thank you and goodbye.